In August 2004, middle-aged couple Joan and John Sterland were murdered, shot dead in their bungalow in a quiet Lincolnshire town. Detectives believed it bore all the hallmarks of a gang-related killing. The hunt for the perpetrators led police to an organised crime empire built on drugs and ruled by violence. The boss of the Bestwood cartel, Colin Gunn, commanded the operation with his brother Dave and their army of henchmen who intimidated, tortured and assassinated to get what they wanted. If you like stories involving power-crazed kingpins, street gangs, corrupt police, failed heists and a disgraced mobster who was killed and allegedly fed to pigs, strap in. This one's a roller coaster. Colin and Dave Gunn were born in Brothers Brothers Colin and Dave Gunn were born in 1967 and 1965 respectively. They grew up on the Bestwood estate just northeast of the center of Nottingham. Coincidentally, exactly the same estate where Harold Shipman, otherwise known as Dr. Death, grew up. Shipman was one of the most prolific serial killers in modern history with over 200 victims. So the Bestwood estate, a somewhat less than salubrious reputation. The Gunn brothers grew into strapping young boys and quickly gained a fearsome reputation on the playground, becoming known as the Bruisers at the Henry Whipple Junior School in the 1970s. As teenagers, they attended Padstow Comprehensive, where they developed their bully boy personas, eventually attaining a level of notoriety in the wider community too. But it wasn't all negative, no. On one occasion, they spotted a thief robbing an old lady. After chasing him down, they even returned her purse. They got a special mention in the church newsletter for that good deed, but it wasn't to last. By the early 1990s, both brothers were in their 20s and steadily clocking up minor convictions for offences like theft, handling stolen goods and violence. By this time, Colin had also served a six-month jail term for his part in a series of cheque frauds, totalling £10,000. A police officer who interviewed him at the time was quoted as saying, he was just an average, run-of-the-mill petty criminal. There was nothing remarkable about him at all at that time, and no hint of the monster he would grow into. I mean, really? At six foot four, built like a brick shithouse, and with that rep, but okay. After Colin's release, the brothers soon began to step up the criminal activities a notch on their home turf. They amassed a gang, which became known as the Bestwood Cartel. Manpower was plentiful. There were numerous thugs on the estate, happy to carry out Gunn's orders for a place in the lower ranks of the organization. To reach the higher positions of power, members had to demonstrate two things, absolute loyalty, and a willingness to relinquish every last hair on their heads. I'm joking, of course. Though it does seem as though every member of the gang was the offspring of some ungodly union between Kojak and Mr. Clean. Initially, the gang ran extortion rackets. Colin, or one of his henchmen, would visit a local business and ask to speak to the gaffer. You know, the boss, the big cheese, the governor. He would point out that the firm's security wasn't very good. But, you know, as luck would have it, for £100 a week, his organisation could provide the very best protection money could buy. When the boss declined and sent them away, coincidentally, some misfortune would befall the company, whether that be a burglary or a brick through the window. As you can imagine, most business owners got the hint and paid up. For those that didn't, Gunn attempted to intimidate them into changing their minds by driving by the establishment attracting the attention of the boss and making gun hand signals. And that usually did the trick. By the 90s, the Gun Brothers had moved into supplying drugs to the area, initially amphetamines, ecstasy and cannabis. But as their organisation gained in strength, they moved onto harder drugs. Colin Gunn, already necking a mixture of bodybuilding steroids on the regular, 
also started using cocaine heavily. And as you can imagine, that combo did nothing to stabilize his mood. As one detective said, Gunn was doing so much cocaine, it was leaving him prone to paranoia and psychopathic violence. One man, suspected by Colin of grassing them up, was taken to a remote area, his hand nailed to a wooden bench and then saturated in petrol while Colin played with a box of matches. The fear he created always meant that it was next to impossible to get witness statements. By 1997, the Bestwood cartel were running a large-scale organisation, spanning money lending, burglaries, extortion, drugs, car ringing and fraud. They were certainly busy bees. Nottingham police were called to incidents on the estate where guns had been discharged into houses from the street outside, or hapless individuals who had somehow strayed from the cartel's orders had been dealt a severe beating. They had intelligence linking Colin Gunn to the majority of these attacks, but witnesses who would testify were incredibly rare. Police constables, often so intimidated that they had to be rewarded with double pay in order to carry out their duty on the estate, quickly uncovered another problem. The Gunn brothers' PR game was strong. In fact, many in the greater Bestwood community regarded them as heroes. Let's hear from Pat. The Godfather, that was Colin Gunn. He was the boss, the mafia boss. Everybody frightened to death of him. If you had a problem, he didn't go to the police. You went to Colin and Colin sorted it. There was brutality, but there was tenderness as well. And he had a very good PR in the fact that he helped people. He set, gave them money for fireworks displays for the kids. People loved him. Um, he was, um, shall we say, a Robin Hood type of thing, uh, because if you was in trouble financially, he would help you out. And at any given time, he can call on you. Yes, many people came to regard Colin Gunn as a modern day Robin Hood. If you ignore the fact that instead of shooting arrows and robbing the rich to give to the poor, he was shooting steroids and robbing the local businesses to further his own interests. Sure, he bunged a few quid in Granny's birthday card and organised a firework display for the kiddies, but Errol Flynn he was not. For a start, Errol had great hair. Nevertheless, one local resident recalled, quote, if you had a problem, they could sort it out, but they expected loyalty in return, and you would have to pay them back sometime, whether that be by running drugs or something else. In October 1998, Colin was arrested for brutally assaulting a man outside what was the Astoria nightclub in Nottingham city centre. The attack was caught on CCTV, but the tapes mysteriously went missing. The victim pressed charges, but without any evidence, Colin was given a token 200 hours community service, which he got an imposter to carry out in his place. A month later, Dave, the more mild-mannered of the brothers, was involved in a bar brawl and received a jail sentence of four and a half years for grievous bodily harm. By 2001, Nottinghamshire police were using Colin regularly as a reliable informant. His reputation for providing useful intel was such that he was even pursued by an officer from the National Crime Squad and encouraged to sign on to their official register. Of course, Gunn wasn't doing this for the greater good. He used his links with the police to bring down rivals and extend the reach of his own organisation. It was in September 2003, following a botched raid in a jewellery shop in Arnold, that the Bestwood cartel really started feeling the heat from the authorities. Four men, wielding guns, charged into the shop and came face to face with young Xanthi Bates behind the counter. Her mother, Marion, heard the commotion and came out from the back of the shop and upon seeing the gunman, ran to shield her daughter. In the ensuing panic, shots rang out, and Marion was fatally injured. She died at the scene. The getaway car was registered to an associate of guns, which was the link back to the cartel. Several of the suspects were convicted, including 22-year-old Craig Moran. The man who fired the gun, James Brodie, vanished mysteriously before police were able to detain him. 
According to accounts from informers, detectives later reported that Brody had likely been assassinated within 48 hours of the botched hit. A notorious heroin addict, the guns couldn't risk him cooperating with the police. Rumours persisted that after he'd been neutralised, his head and hands were removed and his body fed to pigs on a North Nottinghamshire farm. Now, whether that's true or just a pigment of their imagination has never been proven. Oh, and Craig Moran, oh, sorry, Craig Moran, served 12 years and following his release in 2016, disappeared off the radar before popping back up again in 2018. It seemed that he'd stumbled off the straight and narrow once more. Papers reported that he'd been attacked and left for dead by a drug cartel in Marbella, kneecapped, stabbed and sliced on both sides of his mouth, the archetypal Glasgow smile before being dumped in a roadside ditch, a warning perhaps by members of a rival Spanish crime gang. At the time, Marion Bates's daughter and widower spoke out in the press saying he had it coming, once a gangster, always a gangster. Kind of hard to disagree with that. However, it was another incident in August 2003 that kicked off a tragic chain of events, which would become a personal vendetta for the cartel. Colin Gunn's 19-year-old nephew, Jamie, worked on the door of a local pub, the Sporting Chance. One night, some trouble broke out, and in the scuffle, Michael O'Brien got smacked in the head with an ashtray and booted out of the establishment. And well, that was the end of it, thought Jamie. After closing time, Jamie got into a car with his best friend, a local shop fitter named Marvin Bradshaw. As they pulled out of the car park, a figure stepped forward, holding a shotgun, and aimed at the moving vehicle. It was Michael O'Brien, out for revenge. And if I was to hazard a guess by looking at him, probably sporting a hefty concussion. Either way, he shot against the headlights, and Marvin was struck. Tragically, he bled to death as Jamie cradled him in his arms. The Gunn brothers were incensed, and Jamie was inconsolable. He felt entirely to blame, as he'd been O'Brien's intended target. Luckily for him, the law caught up with O'Brien before the Bestwood cartel had a chance to catch him. He was eventually convicted of Bradshaw's murder in July 2004. And then, in a depressing twist of fate, 20-year-old Jamie Gunn was discovered dead only a month later. The official cause of death was pneumonia, but his family and friends believed that he'd never truly recovered from what had happened to his best friend right in front of him the year before. He'd descended into a downward spiral of drink and drugs to numb the pain and was never able to recover. As far as Colin Gunn was concerned, Michael O'Brien now had the blood of two men on his hands and he was going to pay. Colin attended the trial and stared at O'Brien in the dock, but as he, an associate, left the courtroom, O'Brien shouted, Tell fat Colin I've got something for him, or perhaps there's one coming his way. After he was convicted, he hurled a glass of water at Marvin Bradshaw's family in court and said their son's head looked like a donut with a red hole in the middle. Jamie's funeral was, of course, a tense affair. Over a thousand mourners packed St Mary's Church in Bulwell, and at the behest of the cartel, thousands more supporters lined the streets to watch the horse-drawn hearse approach. It was one of the only times that Colin, who had been more like a father to Jamie, appeared to show genuine emotion. But beneath the grief-stricken facade, his mind was busily scheming to concoct a fitting revenge. But this? Well, this would ultimately be his downfall. Now we've come full circle back to the events in August 2004, where this middle-aged couple, the Stirlands, were gunned down in their bungalow, 80 miles away from Bestwood, on the Lincolnshire coast. But what connection were they to Colin Gunn? Well, following the attack on Jamie in the car park of the pub, Gunn couldn't get to Michael O'Brien directly. So he was going after the next best thing, his family. You see, Joan Sterland was O'Brien's mother, 
and John, his stepfather. The cartel learned that Joan was unwilling to make a statement implicating her son in Bradshaw's murder, despite having spoken with the police. And this incensed Colin Gunn. And the couple were warned that there was a very real possibility that their lives were in danger. They'd already had firebombs and homemade hand grenades thrown onto their property. But after shots were fired through their windows, they decided to leave Nottingham for good. They moved to a bungalow in Trustthorpe on the Lincolnshire coast. And a month later, Mrs. Sterlin told relatives, quote, It's the perfect place for us. It's out of the way. Everything's going to be all right. However, on August 8th, the Sterlins made two phone calls to the Lincolnshire police, complaining about a prowler trespassing on their property. Later that evening, after a routine check, police discovered the bodies of 55-year-old John and 51-year-old Joan at the house. Immediate suspicion fell on Colin Gunn and the Bestwood cartel. The crime scene had all the hallmarks of a gang shooting, and detectives had been tracking Colin and his associates' movements for some time. What the police chiefs suspected, but couldn't confirm at that time, was that Gunn had informers inside the force, who would routinely pass information on to him, allowing him to stay one step ahead. Until now. They brought him into custody and conducted several police interviews. The bottom line is, Colin, we believe that all roads lead back to you and your family that are behind this, the killing of Mr. and Mrs. Sterland. It was a, literally an assassination. Is there anything you want to say about the events of that weekend and the, and the days leading up to the killing? I just want to say that I had nothing whatsoever to do with it. I was up the coast with my family and friends. I met family and friends. I went to different parts of the coast and that's all I've done. My mum's got a place, like you say, right near there. Unfortunately, my mum's place happens to be right near to where it happened. But that don't, that, that don't mean that has anything to do with me. It's just that's where my mum's place is situated. I mean, I'm shocked that you've got me an accusing me of these things on the nature of, of, of what you're suggesting. It's just phone calls. We've put you in the scene of the crime at the right time, haven't we? You've you put my phones, if they are my phones, in the area. What, what we're saying, Colin, is that there's not only your phone in that area, but there's also McNeese's phone in that area. Well, but phone if, in that area. If you had all a, the material time, if you, if you had a little chap here, sat here, you'd probably get his friends' phones. We've told you what we think, and we've told you what the evidence is. That's well, it's not evidence, is it? We, it is evidence, yeah. It would later transpire that Gunn procured the Sterling's address through BT engineers on his payroll. One former cartel member said at the time, quote, when the Sterlins got done, that was it. People started seeing what was happening. Colin was out of control. You can't go off shooting someone's grandmother just to get at someone else. That was Colin's downfall. By March 2005, Colin and two cartel members, John Russell and Michael McNee, who both remind me of someone else, were arrested by Nottingham police and charged with conspiracy to murder the Sterlins. Following the trial, on June 30th, the men were found guilty and Gunn was sentenced to 35 years, with Russell and McNee receiving 30 and 25 respectively. Mr Justice Treacy described Gunn as, quote, a dominating leader of others. He told the defendant, you are a crook, a villain, and a large-scale drug dealer. You were the leader of this criminal gang. To your gang, your word was law. Colin took the verdict extremely badly, turning to the jury and shouting, thank you, scumbags, I hope you die of cancer. He then directed his attention to the judge and called him a word starting with P and ending in file, which was the last straw, and saw him forcibly ejected from the courtroom. The day after the verdicts were recorded, there was a large-scale riot on the Bestwood estate, with around 30 individuals setting fire to cars and damaging properties. They were upset about Gunn's conviction and responded by rioting and destroying their own estate. 
the jailing of Colin Gunn provoked a riot on his home estate. The community's just got together and absolutely fuming. 35 years! Police wearing riot gear keep their distance, cordoning off both ends of the roads to prevent the violence from spreading. The boss had been toppled. Was that the end of the Bestwood cartel? Who stepped into the power vacuum? And what became of the underlings? And why did it take the police so long to get enough for a conviction? Well, the cartel limped on with Dave in charge until he was arrested in 2006 and sent to jail for amphetamine possession and supply. And then, without either brother at the helm and with an ongoing police investigation continuing into its activities, support for the organisation waned significantly and members left their ranks in droves. In October 2006, Following a lengthy investigation by the Independent Police Complaints Commission, several members of the Nottinghamshire Police Force were prosecuted. 25-year-old trainee detective Charles Fletcher and Philip Parr, 40, were found to have been passing information on to known associates of the guns. Fletcher even leaked details about the investigation into murdered jewellery shop owner Marion Bates. He passed his intel through an intermediary, one Jason Grocock. Yes, you heard that right. The proprietor of an upmarket gentleman's clothing store. When the details were uncovered in court, Fletcher's ex-colleagues were interested to hear what price Gunn had paid him for his loyalty. After all, his treachery had helped undermine the entire operation and put countless lives at risk. It turns out, all he received for his trouble was a handful of Armani suits. Well, when he left prison after serving a seven-year sentence for corruption and conspiracy to prevent the course of justice, at least he looked sharp. Colin Gunn pops up in the news from time to time. He's had multiple appeals rejected and, as of now, still resides at top security HMP Belmarsh in London. He's been vocal over the years about how prisoners are charged too much for stamps. Writing to the publication Inside Time in 2012 to complain that cons were being overcharged for sending large letters. He also claimed guards were breaching his human rights by refusing to call him Mr. Gunn. He says he complained, won his case, and is now afforded the respect he deserves. And he encourages other prisoners to demand the same. However, the Prisons and Probation Ombudsman, which does not publish the outcome of complaints made by prisoners, declined to comment. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it interesting. If you'd like to support me and help this channel grow, please take a second to like and leave a comment. And do subscribe if you'd like to see similar videos in the future. But until then, take care, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.